I think we've done fairly well actually on Turing, Enigma, all this kind of thing. We've raced around Bletchley Park, saw the Colossus machine, which was for the Tunney or Lawrence Cipher. There is a bit missing in the middle. Why was Colossus necessary? Why did they need a computer? What was the nature of that traffic that Colossus could help with? In one of our previous videos, we've actually shown a picture of this weird trace that they were getting off the airwaves. They showed it to the experts at Bletchley Park and they said, that's broadcast teleprinter traffic. And we've got to remind ourselves, they may not have had electronic computers back in the 1940s, early on, but they certainly did have teleprinter machines. They were very common, used in stock exchanges, used for foreign telegrams, all sorts. It looks a bit like a keyboard. As you press the keys, there was a very comforting splash, splash, splash sound of the electromechanical things, because as well as sending five or maybe even seven hole pulses over the landline, it was also printing out as you went what it was you were typing. So that technology was just phenomenally well known. The staff at Bletchley Park were comforted in a way that it was teleprinter traffic, but puzzled as to its precise nature. However, they'd all been on cryptography training courses and and they or or even been instructors on cryptography training courses. And one of the stories was, don't forget the Vernum cipher. So again, in a previous video, there's more details about this, but a guy called Vernum who worked for um, Bell Labs AT&T in the late 20s, early 30s, had this idea of taking five hole teleprinter codes and exclusive oaring them with an arbitrary letter, which was like a, a cipher key and coming out with a different letter. I'll just do one for you, just to remind you of the sort of principles that went on. Probably available somewhere online, code breaking with a Colossus computer. In the teleprinter code, the letter H is represented by 00101. Now, if you take the letter F, that is 10111 zero. And from numerous videos we've done about the nature of bitwise exclusive OR, it's now dead easy. Exclusive OR says you do it bitwise, it is like an addition, but what happens is the result is one if and only if the two bits differ. If they're the same, then the answer is zero. So zero exclusive OR with one, they're different, that's a one. Zero with zero, they're the same, it's a zero. One with one, they're the same. It uh, answers a zero. Zero with one is one, one with zero is one. The result then of exclusive oring F with H is to give you a cipher result of one zero zero one one. You'd have known this off by heart if you were at Bletchley Park in the middle <laughs> 40s, but I don't know it off by heart. But the answer is that is the letter B. Vernum said, that's, that's a great idea. If I provide a paper tape with a key on it that's random. I'll just, you know, randomize it myself and I'll type in a great long random key stream. If you exclusive or these five bit patterns with each other and the other tape is the plain text top secret message you want to send, then fine, that's a superb way of encrypting it, you see. Believe it or not, Vernum and Bell Labs actually patented this, but there's one huge problem in getting it to work because their idea was you have a five hole paper tape full of your plain text, your secret text you want to send. You have a Gilbert Vernum produced equivalent tape with lots of random, and you just want to run them side by side through some machine that reads that one, reads that one, exclusive ors them and prints out the encrypted result. And what's the problem if you literally use two paper tapes? Keeping them in sync. They had huge difficulties with differential slippage. So you either ended up with them not in line and not working at all or the wrong pattern, been exclusive order with the wrong pattern. So in the end, the feeling I think was among the cryptographic community, this is a promising technique, but there's no way you want to be trying to synchronize two stretchy bits of tape. One bit of tape, fine, you can keep tabs. So there was a knowledge 
in the cipher world that sooner or later somebody would produce the key stream not on another tape but automatically as part of the teleprinter process. You could have a bolt-on accessory to a teleprinter that provided the five-bit key stream automatically, either electronically or electromechanically. And so this one that has become so famous, which uh, the Allies bletchley called Tunny, part of these fishy ciphers, uh, they didn't know what machine was producing it. And our colleague Jack Copeland, historian, and is on top of all these things, says, every time you mention this, you must mention that at Bletchley Park, if you called it Lawrence in 1941, they wouldn't have known what you were talking about. The company that made the machine that did this traffic was a mystery to them. They just called it Tunny. It wasn't just the mystery Tunny machine. There were other machines around. And I have to emphasize this. There was a Hagelin cipher machine in Sweden. There was a Siemens cipher machine. A lot of people were investigating this idea of providing the key stream electromechanically and not on a separate tape. So the overall picture then of exclusiving oring teletype characters, the plain text one with a key character and doing it character by character by character by character, you could summarize it by saying that the cipher text that you prepare is a result of taking a plain text and remember the plus in a circle means exclusive or. So that's your basic equation. Ciphertext is plain text, exclusive ORD, character by character, with the key stream, like that. Now, we did a thing called zigzag decryption, which you can look and you can see the details of that. Cut a long story short, the Allies were very lucky in that by using this special zigzag decryption on a rather weak message, they got a whole bunch of key out of it. And this was like gold dust. In the so-called research section at Bletchley, uh, um, headed up by a guy called Jerry Morgan, picked on a new recruit called Bill Tut. He was from Cambridge, just like uh, Turing, but I empathise with Bill Tut because he started off doing chemistry. And had it been today, he'd have moved into computer science. But as it was then, he gradually turned himself into a mathematician. He loved doing puzzles. He went through his Bletchley pre-training, learnt all about Vernums and whatever, and they put him working on another cog machine called the Hagelin machine, which was used for Italian ciphers. It turned out to be rather simpler than Tunny, and it was good training for him. They'd got tons of stuff from this mystery machine, which was defying analysis. Bill Tut was given the chance to make a name for himself by having a go at it. The only extra information that um, Jerry Morgan gave him was the following. He said, do you know, the Germans, just like we encountered on the Enigma in the very early days, are actually sending us the initial settings. Before we got these 4,000 characters, the Germans sent out what we are calling the indicator, and it's passed into fame and infamy. The indicator, I always pronounce it to myself as H quib pexy Z mug. What you'll find in the literature is people don't want to say it. It's called Zedmug or Zmug, whichever side of the Atlantic you're on. And with my mid-Atlantic persona, please forgive me for switching from one to the other, just like that. So Zmug, Zedmug, was the indicator setting at which they had this lucky break and could get the key. Morgan said to Bill Tutt, he said, you know, the weird thing is we've looked at these settings. They're always alphabetic. And if we're assuming that it's a bit like the Hagelin and there's lots of teeth on there and, the, and all this kind of stuff, they're only ever using 25 letters, except in one of these positions. I can't quite remember which it was now. I think it's the fifth one along. In that position, there's only ever 23 alphabetic letters. We've saved up all the indicators we've ever had. And on that position, they only use 23 letters out of 26. So with his training in mind, Bill Tut said 23 is a prime number. Interesting. I wonder if, a bit like the Hagelin machine, this thing is actually using cogwheels on each of the 
bit streams, five parallel bit streams of a five bit character. Perhaps it's using different wheels on different streams and messing about that way with the patterns of ones and zeros that gets exclusive ord, you know, as part of the key generation exclusive ord thing. I wonder if this is a cogs machine, if there's a 23 tooth wheel somewhere. But then the rest are at 25, right? 23 times 25 is 575. Uh, yeah, let's start investigating. Now, I think at this stage, before we get stuck into what Bill Tuck did, we need to talk about possibilities of repetitions depending on the number of cogwheels you've got. Let me put it to you like this. Suppose you have two very simple cogwheels indeed. So simple, they'd never ever be used in cryptography. But in some sense, these, these things are on a common spindle like that. And every time that rotates, it moves on one position. In fact, I'll use a red pen. I'm saying that this first wheel has only got two possible positions. It can either be there or it can be there. There's a rod, if you like, flipping from being upright there to upright down there. This one, the fact that it looks like a Mercedes-Benz logo is purely coincidental. This one has got three possible positions. Let's call these two positions on the two-toothed wheel A and B. Those are the two possible positions. On the car logo, whatever that brand is, I don't know. Let's just call it one, two and three. The start position we can characterise as being A1. Then we click the spindle and it moves on to the next stop position. A will turn into pointing downwards and being B. The one, on the other hand, on the other one will just go to two. So you get A1, B2. One more click. B will go back to A, but 2 will go to 3. A3. One more click. You'll go from A to B again, but the 3 will go back to 1. B will go back to A again, 1 will go to 2. A will go back to B again, 2 will go to 3. And finally, back to A1. May not look relevant, but it is. This is looking for repeats. When does a pattern repeat? and it depends on the number of teeth on the wheel. So one looks at this and you think, all right, A1, how long before it comes back to being A1? One, two, three, four, five, six. Oh, what a coincidence. We've got a two position wheel. We've got a three position wheel. Three times two is six. It's easy. Instant mathematics. It's obviously the case that all you do is multiply the number of teeth together. Nope. Even Sean shaking his head. Not Co quite. Causation, correlation. Or... Causation and correlation, yes. Those of you who are number five fans, this is trivial stuff, you know it off backwards. But for those of you less familiar, let's just now develop it one stage further and be the devil's advocate. But this time we'll turn the uh, motorised logo into being a cross shape. It's a four position cog here and I'll number it one, two, three three, four. Now since I've done this earlier, I'll write out the sequence for you as to what happens here. It goes A1, B2, onto A3, onto B4, and back to A1. So what's the repeat length? Four. But look, there's four on that, there's two on that, it ought to be eight. Why isn't it eight? Why is it only four? And the answer is, there are factors in common. This is two, that is 4. 4 is not a prime number, it's 2 times 2. So the factor of 2 is a, is a common, it's like doing lowest common denominators in, you know, when you're combining fractions, you try and find out what's the thing on the bottom that's got everything in it, but it is as small as possible. And that is what is happening here. You don't want cogwheels with factors in common, because otherwise your repeat length will be a lot shorter than you ever imagined. Finally, I'll just draw out the possibility for you. We'll do a three with a four. And now we've now got A, B, C. One, two, three, four. What is the overall length of the repeat cycle? And the answer is it's 12. And you look at that and you say, four times three is 12. But four isn't a prime number. So why is it working out okay again that you do just multiply them? The answer is that three and four are what's called relatively prime, 
Although 4 isn't a prime number, it doesn't have any factors in common with 3. So therefore, relatively prime, sometimes called co-prime, the story will go then on the numbers of teeth on these wheels we think in this machine. They'll either be a prime number, or if they run out of prime numbers and, and the, pri the prime number of teeth getting a bit big, the next best thing, because it is safe, is to use relatively prime numbers. And in the long run, we will find, in this thing we're going to talk about, that one of the cogs has got 26 teeth on it, which is not prime, but it's 2 times 13. So, so long as that has no factors in common with anything else, that's equally safe. So, this then was the backdrop of what they were expecting, what Bill Tote was expecting. It was that there would be a machine, probably with several cogs in it of some sort, and that prime numbers of teeth would probably be involved. So, remembering what Jerry Morgan had said to him about this, that one of these positions had only got 23 possible alphabetic characters, all the rest had 25, he said, OK, what about the product of 23 by 25? There aren't any factors in common, you see, 23 is prime. Tell you what I'll do, he said. Rather than worrying about the whole character, let me just look at the leftmost stream of bits in all these characters. Now, I would call that bit stream one. What they did at Bletchley Park was they called it impulse one. What I'm talking about is the stream of bits from all of the characters, like, you know, the bit that's in the number one position over all characters in the message, from one to five, left to right. He started off with what he regarded as bitstream one, the leftmost one. He said, remembering my training, which said, if you think there's going to be repeats, have a look for them. And he said, well, why not do two at once? If I do 23 times 25, I might be able to spot vertical runs happening every 23. If I write them out in a block, I might see them at 25 because they're not going to interfere. They're relatively prime. So on an enormous sheet of paper, and it doesn't matter whether it's Turing, Bill Tut or a host of other workers at Bletchley Park, they use acres of big sheets of paper divided up into squares to make notes on. And he said, I wrote it out along a great long strip, 575 bits, then another 575, then another 575. And don't forget, this intercept was 4,000 characters. So he ended up with six and a half huge long rows, all on this combined period of 575. And he said, I was expecting to look down vertically and find every 23 there was a bunch of ones or something like this, or every 25 there was patterns. Didn't see that. Looked at it carefully, and to my amazement, he said, as you look at it, I saw going down these five rows a clear diagonal sequence of ones going like that, but down a diagonal. What did that tell me? I'd got the wrong period. It wasn't 575, it was 574. 41 is a factor of 574. So, as he says in his paper, if people say this genius built up was straight on to spotting 23 and 25 and it's the first thing he found, no he didn't. He went off down the wrong trail temporarily, but accidentally, with sheer pure luck, found that the number one stream was having its ones and zeros that were added to it was generated by a wheel probably with a periodicity of 41. But the Germans wouldn't be daft enough to make sure there's a blindingly obvious repeat every 41. They'll be messing about going on behind the scenes. It will be 41, but it will perhaps be disguised. But maybe they didn't totally succeed in disguising it enough. Armed with 41, what he then did said, right, I'm going to write down all of these uh, sequences now not on a 575 grid, but on a grid of 41. So he writes out this impulse stream of ones and zeros, but uh, the tradition at Bletchley was to use dot for zero and x for one. 
Tut says he can't understand why they did this. Other people say it's all very well, Bill, for you mathematicians wanting ones and zeros, but I find patterns easier to spot with dots and crosses. I think I agree, actually. And when he put out all these impulses, all 4,000 of them, on a grid 41 across, you suddenly find that not on every row, but on quite a few of them, there are certain patterns that repeat. So the message from that is, yes, there is a wheel with 41 teeth is involved, but there's almost certainly some extra stage where it's trying to disguise what's going on. That might be another wheel with different teeth or something's going on. It's not pure and simple. It wouldn't be because it'd be dead easy to decrypt if it was. But there is a sneaky suspicion 41's involved. So... Bill Turk tells the rest of the research section who piled in and helped because, what, as he points out, the next obvious thing to do is look at the number two stream, look at the number three stream, look at the number four stream, look at the number five stream. And when we've worked out what the initial wheels, how many teeth they've got on, then we can take that away and start looking to see if we can figure out how the excess stuff that's trying to distort it gets generated. And to cut a very long story very short, after a few weeks work of probably 10 or 11 people, what they finally came up with was in this diagram here. They decided that initially your stream from your teleprinter was put through five distinct cogs, one for each bit stream or impulse. The numbers of teeth were 41, 31, 29, 26, 23. So as Tut says, eventually if I'd not discovered the 41. I would have proved what a genius I was because 23 is there. It's just that it's on stream 5, not stream 1, but it is there, right? And then they managed to discover that the obscuring mechanism was another set of wheels which sometimes turned on by one place and sometimes didn't. And these have got 43, 47, 51, 53 and 59 teeth. And the eagle-eyed among you who will watch every single morsel of number file will immediately jump on our necks and say 26 isn't prime. No, it isn't. It's 2 times 13, but it's relatively prime to everything else. Equally, 51 isn't prime. It's 3 times 17. Fine. So if you use other relative priminesses, you can't have 2s or 3s involved in their factors because they're taken up now. But that was it. These two extra wheels at the bottom. See, that was another thing. They could sort of understand why 10 wheels, two sets of... of fives, well, what do the other two do? The other two, in a very complicated way, determine whether this second set of wheels moves or stays still. And I think the Germans were hoping that by that mechanism they would confuse the Allied decryption effort even more. Because the first set always move. You do a character worth and you go click and they all move on. But they've got different numbers of teeth on them. Um, second set sometimes moves, sometimes doesn't. By the end of the war, the feeling was from people like Jack Good and Donald Mickey, who had a look at this statistically, they said, you know, by the time you got used to looking for whether the wheels were moving, the stutter, we call it, you got to be able to spot the stutter. And it was such a landmark, once you were really familiar with it, that the Germans actually did themselves a disfavour. They'd have been better off not to put it in. They managed to get all of that structure out of it. What they realised was their next big task was to say, OK, we know the number of teeth on each wheel, but what we don't know is the patterns on the wheels of ones and zeros that they are contributing to the exclusive or key characters. So that was another great long journey because they knew that on the Hagelin machine, so it's probably similar on the Tunney machine, that on every cog there was a little slider which you could set up or down. And in one position it contributed a naught, but if you put it down it always contributed a one. So can you imagine going the, the task of setting this wretched thing up? You've got all of these cogs with all these teeth, and if you add up the total number of teeth, there's several hundred, and every one of these positions has got to be set up with a one or a zero, according to this instruction manual. 
Do you think they change them every day? Not a chance. They only changed the wheel patterns once a month. You've got the indicator that tells you what the wheel settings are. You can work for a whole month on trying to work out what the wheel patterns are. And once you've got it, you can decrypt like mad. What would happen if they ever stopped saying, let's not put the indicator out. It only helps them. Well, it doesn't help them. It's totally secure, but it's pointless to put it out, just like on Enigma. So in the middle of early to middle of 1942, they stopped putting out the indicator. Oh dear. Calamity. And I should caveat this by saying I'm going to be talking in general terms. Each operating system, whether that's Windows, Linux, Mac OS, iOS, BSD, insert your favourite operating system here that you probably...